And just to be clear on what we mean by abiotic, um, of course, there are plant diseases that can happen on vegetables, um, but some of those diseases can be caused by non-living factors. And so we call those abiotic diseases. Um, so as an example, um, let's say you're trying to figure out, um, well, is this problem I'm seeing, say a leaf spot on the foliage, is it really um, caused by a pathogen, a fungus or bacteria um, or by the environment? So there are some clues that you can look at when you're trying to diagnose the problem. And so these two pictures shown on the left um, would indicate some of those clues. So the one on the far left is um, a leaf that's having some leaf spots. And there's a little bit of an indication that says, okay, I think this is caused by a pathogen. Um, the leaf spots are going along the veins. Um, they're not all the same size. So you have some smaller ones and some larger ones. And they're not really in a pattern on the leaf itself. They're sort of randomly scattered throughout. Uh, so that might indicate this is uh, infectious disease. And then the one in the middle, this is showing some leaf spots again. There are various sizes. We've got some real teeny ones, some larger ones, and then some that are uh, merging together into one big blotchy area. And also they have this yellow halo around them, which is indicating that those spots are spreading or becoming maybe becoming larger in size. The pathogen is growing ahead of the spot and then you get the brown tissue. So those are just some examples of what might be a biotic disease. And then uh, in contrast, what would be abiotic example? Um, again, these are um, not vegetable leaves, they're oak leaves, but still it gives you an idea of what I'm trying to show. So these, uh, this picture on the right is a pile of leaves. And if you look at the brown part, the necrotic part, you can almost fold that leaf in half and it's the same on either side. Um, and the size of those lesions are all pretty similar. Um, so there's a nice pattern going on there. And also there's a real distinct demarcation between the brown tissue and the green tissue. So you usually don't see that with um, biological or pathogens. So this would be on the right, what we're gonna be talking about are abiotic diseases. So that's just a quick diagnosis rundown. Um, and um, in general, Nick mentioned, okay, there's, we're see, getting a lot of questions about issues with heat stress, uh, drought issues. So abiotic problems on plants can be pretty common. In fact, there's a Utah plant pest diagnostic lab and they get samples from all over the state. And in general, about 80% of those are abiotic problems. Um, and a lot of times because the abiotic problems are sometimes more difficult to diagnose. And so a little bit of extra help is needed. So this picture on the right, this was actually something new for me that I just learned uh, in the last few weeks. So I got an email um, of a cabbage grower and um, had a question about the cabbage kind of exploding, um, but really wondering what was eating and munching off the cabbage uh, centers. Because it came, look, look at this crop one day and it was all eaten up. Um, but in reality, what had happened was uh, the cabbage spontaneously split from a biotic problem. Um, this happens when the cabbage, which needs a lot of water, goes through a dry spell and then gets heavy irrigation or rainfall. So there's a lot of pressure that builds up inside the cabbage. And it's more pronounced when they are close to or even beyond the harvest time or when the plant's been given a lot of irrigation, um, sorry, fertilization. Um, so there's a lot of these intricacies that happen that cause these abiotic problems with plants, dealing, especially dealing with the environment. So I wanna point out this publication that Nick um, was the primary author on and it's called Abiotic Disorders of Tomatoes. So it's really great with lots of pictures um, and you can get it at this website. And um, Nick, if you wanna put it in chat, you can. So it's a USU Extension store and you would select yard and garden. And it's only five bucks, um, but it's 57 full color pages. So some of the, um, 
situations I'm going to mention, I'll have the, the picture of this book on that slide so you know that it's found in that book. Okay, so what I'm going to cover are um, some examples of abiotic problems related to the weather, so temperature extremes and um, pollination. I included it there can sometimes be weather related. And then uh, some issues with soil moisture where the problem may be caused by drought or excess water. Um, some examples of chemical uh, damage to plants and then finish up with just some examples of nutrient deficiencies. So starting with issues that would be caused by weather uh, related conditions. So we're, we're dealing with hot weather right now, but earlier in the spring, you may have had um, uh, a time to see cold temperature injury because we did have um, a couple, maybe three pretty bad frost uh, situations. One of them was even in early June. So with cold temperature injury, of course, it's damaging the plant cells. And here on the right is bean, and on the left is a coal crop. So um, hmm, I believe that is Brussels sprouts, but I'm not 100% sure. But anyway, the damage on these two, it just essentially bleaches the foliage. So that tissue that dies just turns white. And a lot of times, shown on the left, it can be in between the veins. So the veins and tissue around the veins is able to withstand that cold temperature a little bit better. On tomato, um, you put plant your tomato plants out too early, you're likely to see some cold temperature damage. And it's the same with the others. It turns the tissue this uh, bleached area, but it's more uh, small, distinct spots. It could be on the stem, shown on the left, on the foliage itself. Um, and sometimes the foliage may turn a little bronzy color. Uh, but with all these cases, the plants can grow out of it pretty well. So these are some pepper plants, and this was um, a grower that contacted me uh, many years ago, about eight years ago in Perry, and he had a whole field of these pepper plants, and they were, just were not growing. So this was in the spring. They had this stunted growth at the tips, very small leaves. Um, flowers were not deformed, not properly uh, forming. And so he really didn't know what was going on, thought it was a virus or some other disease. And it was just simply the temperatures were too cold in the evening. Um, so it was a little confusing because the daytime temperatures were fine, but the evening temperatures were too cold and the plants just weren't growing. And they ended up coming out of it fine. So always take those weather conditions into account with plant problems. Um, still on the thread of cold damage. So these are strawberries, of course, and the damage can occur in the crown of the strawberry shown in this picture on the right, which is really a modified stem where uh, the plants are all stunted in the spring, they're not growing well, then you might wanna sacrifice a plant and slice it in half and look at the crown and see if the tissue inside is brown. And that would be indicative of cold injury. And then on the left are examples of flower of fruits that have come from flowers that had suffered cold injury. So the um, individual seeds in the flowers didn't, in the uh, fruits didn't form, they're dead, and then the fruit kind of expands around those areas. All right, so now moving on to what we're seeing now, which is the hot conditions. Um, and sometimes uh, those uh, mulch products that we use, in particular the black plastic mulch, which a lot of growers use to keep weeds away, sometimes they can cause problems, other problems. So in this case, it was peppers, green peppers planted in late spring or so. And the temperatures got to be in the 90s, um, but that plastic, can heat up to 140 or so. Um, and so that temperature extreme when those transplants are still pretty tender can just really basically fry them and, um, and kill the cambium right there at the, where it comes into contact with the black plastic. So stem necrosis of pepper is something to you know, watch out for if you're using black plastic mulch and the temperatures get high. 
Um, heat injury, if you are love to grow broccoli like I do, um, can be a problem in terms of not getting the right crop that you want. So the picture on the right um, shows a, a healthier broccoli crown on the left and then on, on the right side. And then on the left is broccoli exposed to heat that um, is showing these really small flower clusters, um, lots of foliage, um, and the they start to go to flower earlier. So the heat can have an, that type of effect on broccoli. Um, the same would be seen on Brussels sprouts as well, where um, they're just not, you're not forming as many Brussels sprouts, or again, they're going to flower earlier. And then on the left is a variety of broccoli um, called snow cloud that is more of a white color, but it's very susceptible to heat injury. Um, and it's turning those florets kind of purplish in color. And uh, maybe you've seen, I've seen some broccoli with purplish coloration at the grocery store even. And a lot of that is attributed to heat injury. So also with heat and especially excessive amounts of heat at uh, certain times of the day is sun scald of our fruits like tomato shown on the left and then peppers on top. And peppers really seem to be very susceptible to sun scald. Um, sometimes it just affects the outer skin of the fruit, but sometimes it kills uh, the skin completely, shown in this picture in the middle, where eventually the skin will drop off and there'll probably be some rot that's introduced. So sun scald can potentially uh, decrease the yield by anywhere from uh, two to five percent. So it can be an issue uh, on those crops as well as others like watermelon, pumpkin, cucumber, shown in these pictures. Um, and it may not necessarily reduce the uh, flavor of these particular crops here, but it's certainly going to reduce the marketability if you wanted to sell these types of crops. So what some people have done to try and reduce these effects of sun scald and heat is to use shade cloth. Um, and, you know, we're talking a little bit more labor and time invested, but in the end, um, it will completely prevent any of that sun scald or heat injury from happening. So on the top right is one grower that had actually put up a whole trellis system with shade cloth over the entire crop. And then on the left was a little bit um, more novel idea of putting that shade cloth vertically to shade the plants at the hottest time of the day in late afternoon. So that's a little less labor involved. Um, so for both of these, it was about 10, anywhere from 10 to 30% shade cloth uh, and it reduced the sun scald injuries by 100%. Okay, and on the bottom was an idea done for peppers where the plants were all staked or kind of trellised in a system that the foliage then would protect all of that fruit from damage. So in this study, they found that this trellising system had just 2% sun scald injury and those that were not trellised had 20% injury. So another kind of maybe simple idea, this is a problem that you're seeing every year. Uh, so finally with the heat stress um, and not something that would be cured with shade cloth is uh, necrosis of the flesh of potatoes. Um, this really happens late in the season towards harvest, um, August to September, where um, the days and the nights are very hot, um, may not necessarily matter the soil moisture, it's more the soil temperature, uh, that this brown necrosis might not be evident until after harvest. So that type of heat necrosis could be reduced um, by trying to keep the soil a little bit more shaded. So, um, the plant spacing, reducing it will prevent the potatoes from um, uh, being more exposed to, to the heat, um, not having so much plant material in one area.
but maintaining a healthy canopy, um, and that will also help reduce soil temperature. Mulching, which I don't have on here, would help. Um, but also harvesting in the evening or early in the morning when temperatures are cooler um, may help prevent this necrosis of the potato flesh. Okay, so um, regarding heat and drought is pollination. Um, are we getting good pollination, especially on our tomatoes? And one of the questions that comes up a lot, if you guys aren't familiar with it, is this picture on the left is flower drop. And so tomatoes, they normally shed their pollen during the day. So from about four to 10 uh, in the afternoon. And then um, with cool temperatures at night, then you'll have this perfect fruit set. But when the temperatures are very high consistently during the day, and that pollen is being produced and shed, it actually starts to degrade. It degrades, there's not as much pollen, um, and it's just, it's not as healthy. And so you have that problem with consistent hot daytime temperatures. And then in the evening, if there are also hot temperatures, then there won't be any fruit set. And so as a result, you'll get this, what's called pollen drop, I'm sorry, flower drop. So that is a result of these high uh, day temperatures and high evening temperatures, and you have very poor fruit set. Um, but if you have, there is enough pollination to form a fruit, but it wasn't um, complete pollination, there can be other issues with the actual product or the fruit that's left on the plant. And that's shown in the picture on the right, the, um, the gel that forms between the seeds and the, the outer flesh is not fully formed. So you have these big cavities within the fruit. And then the, on the top, the fruit itself might kind of collapse in. And so it's just not going to be as tasty as what you normally might uh, find with a nice juicy tomato. Um, and then on the outer flesh here, there's some white flecks or speckling. And that too is an indication of poor pollination uh, or not full pollination um, as the fruit has preventing the fruit from forming normally. So, so those are some issues with uh, tomatoes. Um, other crops can also suffer from poor pollination. So, you know, squashes have a male and a female flower. And so it's important that those specialty pollinators, like the specialty bees that visit the squash flowers, visit those female flowers enough. Um, and if they don't, then you get incomplete or poor pollination where the fruit starts forming. It may be just deformed, abnormal looking as shown in the picture on the left, um, but still be partially edible. Um, and then on the right, the fruits may start to form, but then just eventually rot because they're really not going to ever become fully formed fruits. So they can poor pollination, another example. And then finally is on our sweet corn, um, which I assume is coming up for harvest uh, in the next month or so. Um, but again, with heat conditions, consistent hot temperatures, the pollen and the silk uh, flowers don't coincide with each other. So pollen is being released before the silks are fully elongated or ready for pollination. And so as a result, you just have partially formed uh, corn cobs. Again, still edible, but not marketable. All right, finally, with the weather conditions section is um, damage from hail. And last year, we had some pretty good hailstorms across the state. Um, as far as I know, we have not had hailstorms yet. They seem to happen every summer. Um, and sometimes they happen, but people don't remember they happen and they go out and look at their garden and find situations like this, like on the left with leaves just completely tattered, um, sometimes left with not much at all. On the top right, you have some leaves that are look like they're bleached, like um, I talked about with the cold injury, but that's just light, light injury on the surface of those tomato uh, foliage, and then on the bottom injury to the fruits. So again, if you're not thinking about the hail damage and you look at your plants, just make sure that you um, address what could be causing these problems because these symptoms are 
A, they're pretty, they would be widespread on the whole plant. Um, and if it was hail, it might, the damage on a tomato, for example, might just be on one side, not on the underside. Um, so certain things, again, to look at and think about to diagnose what might have caused the problem. Okay, so now moving to some issues with soil moisture. And a lot of these aren't necessarily too much moisture, not enough moisture, it's more consistent soil moisture. And again, like Nick was saying, it's hard now with water restrictions, um, you know, what, what to do. And, and we can talk more about that later if, uh, if that comes up. But I did wanna talk about what could happen with these various moisture extremes. So one is on potatoes. Um, so this is showing what's called black heart of potato and it's caused by low oxygen. And so you might think, well, what does you know, soil moisture have to do with that? Well, when you think about waterlogged soils or even a potato that's surrounded by a film of water, there's no oxygen exchange that's gonna be possible between the potato and the rest of the soil. And so with low oxygen, then the fruit just starts to rot from the inside. All plants need oxygen in the soil. So this would be a condition of um, high soil moisture um, near the time of harvest. So if the soil is kept dry, 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 and you're coming up, oh my goodness, I'm coming up to harvest, I need to do a lot of watering, then, um, and you have kind of clayey soils, this would be a situation that you could run into. So to avoid this problem, just make sure that your, the soils do have good drainage and try not to irrigate excessively. Um, and a way to make the soil more um, light and airy is to till the soil and also incorporate more organic matter. Um, water or potatoes that are getting ready to be stored, they should not be stored wet because that's gonna contribute to this black heart after uh, potatoes go into storage. And um, in storage, maintain that good aeration, which that I know you guys are all uh, aware of. So another example still with potato um, in terms of water extreme is called hollow heart of potato. And that is when the potatoes actually get um, pretty good moisture uh, throughout and then they, they don't have a lot of moisture. So they're growing very fast. Um, and then when the, uh, the moisture level drops, they uh, kind of split in the center. So you get this hole in the middle of the potato. And this potatoes with this problem are still quite edible. Um, it's just that center part that would need to be cut out. But again, this is that example of the temperature, I'm sorry, mo soil moisture extreme from dry to very wet. Okay, another example of the uh, soil moisture extremes is tomato cracking. And it's something that all tomato growers really try and prevent, have to deal with. Um, so it's the, the tomato that is getting, um, low water, high water, low water, high water, so that the, the tomato expands and then kind of uh, explodes because it, there's just so much moisture that has take, been taken up suddenly after being dry that the fruit itself cannot contain all that moisture. Um, and so sometimes the cracking can be pretty deep, the picture on the top right, that so it introduces rot. And in other cases, it's not so bad, the tomato is still edible. Um, so with the avoidance here, um, there are some varieties that are more susceptible to cracking. A lot of our heirloom varieties are pretty susceptible, but some that are less so um, are listed here. Um, and if you're seeing cracking and you want to grow those tomatoes that are susceptible, then try your best to keep that optimal level of soil moisture, consistent really. And mulching around the base of these plants to prevent these problems uh, will go a long way to keeping that even soil moisture. So if any tomatoes are seen that are cracking, it's best to harvest them even if they're slightly green and that's gonna prevent 
uh, insects from being attracted to them um, or any kind of rod or anything else being introduced. Also, if you like to go grow radishes um, or these other crops that uh, you're harvesting the roots, the water extremes from um, dry to very wet can also affect those. So it's the same idea as what I just mentioned with the um, tomatoes where in dry soils, they're not growing as well. And then they be, the soils become very wet. The, uh, these roots grow very rapidly. And when they become dry, they'll crack again. Uh, so these are pictures, all examples of what that cracking can look, up, look like in those roots. And then not necessarily poor, uh, sorry, uh, moisture extremes, but more poor soils is examples of forking that can happen in uh, these root vegetables. Um, again, radishes, daikon, carrots. So they may fork from poor organic matter in the soil. You know, they're searching for the right nutrients. Um, this is, these are pictures from a, a research paper, but um, you might imagine there's a big rock here that's causing that forking. So some of them you can't help, um, but others are, um, they've shown that this forking is more common in soils that have less organic matter. So, and more compacted soils too, where they're just, they're just not able to penetrate through that, uh, the soil condition. Okay, so another, uh, indication of um, abiotic disease is damage from chemicals. So we call that phytotoxicity. So phyto meaning plant and toxicity meaning damage. So damage to the plant um, can occur from drift. If you're next door to a farm, from anything that may, they may have sprayed, it can be from pesticides or um, herbicides that are volatilizing. So vapors, so there's a lot of different mechanisms for pesticides to approach or get in contact with plants. So I do want to show some examples. So these are not vegetables, but this, these pictures show what happened when you apply a fungicide. So this is called captan and oil has either been mixed with the fungicide or the oil has been applied within 48 hours of the captan. Uh, so the oil makes the captan penetrate into the plant tissue faster than it would otherwise. So they, for the pictures on the far left and the far right is what you would classically see. These spots on the leaves that are pure brown or tan, there's no halo around the spots and the spots don't grow over time. And they're not spreading from plant to plant. So the, we actually get this question a lot, not this particular fungicide problem, but phytotoxicities on foliage that mimic uh, a leaf spot disease. So horticultural oil, hopefully you guys are all familiar with that insecticide. It's great for our soft bodied insects like aphids and spider mites. But when it's applied on a day that the temperatures get above 85 degrees, the oil combined with the heat will damage the plant tissue. So it will result in this variety of different conditions, but it's usually um, this kind of blighted foliage or it looks like the water's kind of been running on the foliage itself. And it's shown on the right. And then this, is, this example is a pepper plant that was applied with an insecticide. And, you know, to be honest, it really doesn't matter what insecticide or fungicide was used. A lot of times there can be a problem when these products are used in very hot temperatures. And I mean, by hot, I mean maybe 90 to 95 or hotter within four hours of application. So here it's just um, essentially scorched the foliage um, and the tissue that's up higher it was not sprayed. And so that is not, has not been damaged. So these plants with this type of phytotoxicity damage will recover, um, but it will lessen their vigor for forming the fruits that you want. 
Um, herbicide injury is probably the, the one that really affects our vegetable crops the most in terms of pesticides. So this is one called 2,4-D, and that is a common herbicide used in our turf for, um, for weeds. And the issue is that when the temperatures are hot, it can volatilize and those gas vapors can spread a long ways, um, several hundred yards. So these uh, watermelon seedlings were in a greenhouse um, here on the left and uh, the field that was sprayed was a good distance away, but those vapors became trapped in the, um, the greenhouse area because it was left open. So unfortunately, a lot of these plants were affected by the herbicide injury and actually causing splitting to the stem. Another example, plant on the left, um, 2,4-D damage. These are both tomatoes. Uh, the plant on the left was in a high tunnel. So another case where those vapors kind of traveled in and became trapped in the high tunnel and really exacerbating the injury. So you get this um, curled foliage distortion and really those top more succulent uh, parts of the plant are much more affected by the 2,4-D damage. So dicamba is another relative of 2,4-D, common herbicide used in our um, residential lawns, turf, also in uh, golf courses, et cetera. Um, and so the damage is shown here. And there has been some indication that the um, some of the residues from plants that have been killed by dicamba have been uh, mixed in with compost and you get your compost say at the city bring it in grow your plants and then they're showing this damage so it's not coming from something that happened in your yard or your neighbor's yard it was actually in the soil uh, so it's a little dicamba is a little more persistent but um, again symptoms are are similar you get this uh, deformed foliage, elongated veins, and uh, in this case, the leaves kind of cup upward. So, and remedying chemical injury like these that I've showed you, um, if herbicide damage is really bad, there has been some evidence that incorporating a lot of organic matter where you can, um, or charcoal can absorb certain herbicides from the soil. And <clears throat> some herbicides like the 2,4-D can be washed to the soil, can be leached out. So a deep irrigation might help. Um, but in general, you know, try not to use those products in high heat and, you know, keep the garden obviously in optimal health. So the last section is nutrient deficiencies. And this one's very short. Um, but I want to start with one that you all, I hope, are familiar with, and that is blossom end rot. So this is a situation where the calcium is not being carried through the plant sufficiently to the, the stem ends of the fruit. So that we have plenty of calcium in our soils. But when there's not enough water in the soil, then the calcium is not moving and translocated through the plant fully and um, consistently. So then you get this dieback or lack of calcium in that end of the fruit. And that's like the end place where the calcium would need to travel. So it happens on our tomatoes. Um, it can also happen on other crops like watermelon and even squash. Um, another issue with calcium is if you're growing lettuce. So this can also be a problem. Again, it's the same idea where the calcium is just not being translocated through the plant consistently due to inconsistent soil moisture, dry to wet, dry to wet. So you, for lettuce, you get this, what's called tip burn. So a little bit of dieback on the ends of the leaves of the lettuce. And this, this is just an image I pulled from a paper um, showing various deficiencies in tomato. Um, nitrogen is on the top left where the leaves are fully yellow. 
phosphorus in the second where the leaves start to turn a bit purplish, um, potassium, zinc, and onward. So a lot of these we don't see so much, but um, seems like uh, phosphorus, nitrogen might be issues in our tomato plants. So uh, remedying nutrient deficiencies. First, you wanna know what is the problem. So be sure and use our um, USU Analytical Lab. It's located in Logan, Utah, and there's the web address there. They can do soil tests for you. I think they're about 35 bucks. Um, and they can also test the foliage as well if that's necessary. Um, but I wanna make a comment about calcium. If that turns out to be what is the deficiency, is correct the water imbalances, keep the soil consistently wet, um, make sure the soil is not compacted or you're disturbing any of the roots by like cultivating out weeds. And then finally for blossom and rot on tomatoes, there's lots of sprays you can buy for blossom and rot, but they're really not that effective because the calcium doesn't penetrate through the skin of the uh, tomato. It is absorbed in the foliage, but it's not translocated from the foliage to the tomato. So your best option, if it's just a problem year after year, is you can add nice, uh, calcium to the soil. There Again, there's calcium there already, but applying it may help with the, the problem that you're having year after year. 